Good morning. How's everyone? You look a little hungover. <laughs> Did everybody get everything they wanted for Christmas? Yeah? I've got one more gift I want. It starts at 1 o'clock today. <laughs> yeah. You're about to find out whether your pastor's been naughty or nice this year. That's how that works. Uh, thrilled that you're here. And... Uh, we're going to conclude our series about you can't always judge a gift by its wrapping and we're looking at uh, the Gospel of John in two passages and today we're going to look at the gift of life it often does not come wrapped the way we would prefer um, in John the first chapter it says in the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I'm going to jump down to verse 9 where it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decisions or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then one more passage from the Gospel of John, John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Uh, in your view, do you think Jesus had a full life? It's a good question because it wasn't very long. He lived to be about 33 and a half years old. And he attracted large audiences, but they were pretty fickle. Sometimes they cheered and applauded him. Sometimes they jeered him. Sometimes they just didn't show up at all. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends, denied by another of those friends, and abandoned by all of his friends. While he was on the cross, people would say things like this from the foot of the cross up to him. Physician, since you're known to be able to heal others, why can't you heal yourself? Or if you're really the son of God, come down from the cross because the general assumption is if you're spiritual enough, there's no crosses in your life. When you're going through a, a challenging season, getting through something that's really weight-bearing, exhausting, fatiguing, draining, discouraging, disheartening, all of those things, who is likely to be more of an encouragement to you? Is it someone who never seems to have had a single problem in their life? Everything always goes exactly the way they want it, or at least it appears that way, or someone who's been through some seriously dark and difficult times. The truth is, is that we often want to hear from those who've been through what we are going through. One of the reasons the words of Jesus still minister to so many people today is because he was known as a person who was acquainted with grief and a man of sorrows. He understands what we're going through. And in the birth of Jesus, this life that came into the world that wound up being a light unto the world, this life that came into the world was the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon and overshadowed Mary. The work of the Spirit, think about this, the work of the Spirit is to bring Jesus into human life. That's the work of the Spirit. Wherever you find the work of the Holy Spirit, we find Jesus being made human. That doesn't erase his divinity. But a lot of people can only see Jesus as 
this super spiritual being, kind of like a balloon. How many of you ever had kids that you bought a helium balloon for them and it didn't last very long because it lasted as long as their attention span and they just let it go and, and there it goes. Uh, we got one for our daughter one time. Evidently that balloon had been around a while because when she let it go, it just stayed right there. And she would do things, and then she'd pick it up and she would go on and <laughs> she would let it go and it would stay right there. That's not how it works for most helium balloons. They, they fly up and hit the ceiling or up into the sky. And that's how a lot of people see Jesus. Um, can't quite get a grasp on him. Can't get a hold of him. But I see enough of him to know that he's real. And that concept of Jesus is actually not helpful. The Holy Spirit brings him into our world in human flesh. And when spiritual gifts are exercised, sometimes we think we have to put on some kind of a, a show so that people know this is something different. The most powerful works the Holy Spirit will ever do through you is when you look exactly like you. If you have to put on some kind of persona, become some different kind of person, act in some different kind of way, change your voice and your language and your posture so that everyone in the room knows what? That you are a floating balloon. It, it doesn't really work that way. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus human. The Holy Spirit doesn't tell us that our problems and our pain and our burdens and our challenges aren't real. He says they are real, and he brings a real Jesus with real grace and real power into our real life to do something about it. In fact, the litmus test for Christianity is told to us in 1 John, written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. This is what he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. This is it, the litmus test. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Spirits that don't acknowledge that. They're not from God. When we fail to take the humanity of Jesus seriously, we wind up not taking the humanity of our world or the humanity of the church or the humanity of ourselves seriously. So, well, you're, you're saying, Pastor, that Jesus isn't divine. I'm not saying that. He's fully divine, but he's also fully human. And if we can't grasp that, there's a lot of things we'll never think, there's a lot of things we'll never say, there's a lot of things we'll never do. So real life, even though it's not wrapped always the way we want to, real life recognizes that God is with us. You just heard Stephen talk about this a moment ago when he said his favorite word in the Christmas season is Emmanuel, God with us. Not God just watching us, not God just aware of us, but God with us. You know, it's amazing to me how many times the assumption of people is this, if I'm going through a difficult or painful season in life, that somehow God has abandoned me. They, that because God is in heaven, that he is only in places that are perfect in every way and as well as completely carried out. And the commitment of Scripture, both Old and New Testament, is he will not forsake us, he will not abandon us, he will not leave us. God is with us, right where you are. If you are in a difficult situation, God is with you in that situation. Your problem and your pain is not proof that he has abandoned you. He's with you in the midst of all of it. Uh, second thing about real life is that real life trusts that God is for us. Not just with us but for us. Now, you've probably heard someone say something like this, right? Uh, it, it's a loyalty test. Are you with us or not? Not just are you present, but are you for us? That's a really important distinction. And what Jesus in the flesh tells us is not just that God is with us, present, but God is 
for us. He has our best interests at heart. And then real life allows us, the third thing, real life allows us God to do something in us. Now this is a big deal. Because if I were to ask you, if you could design the rest of your life, what would it look like? I wonder what you would include and what you would not include. Well, let's just do a, a couple of tests this morning. How many here, if you were designing the rest of your life, at least part of it would include a place that has palm trees? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, let me ask you this. Would you include any days that there were doubts you were struggling with? Would you put that in the life you were designing? Would you put in any problems that you had to work through? Would you put in any moments of fear that you had to face? Would you put in any loss that you had to grieve and recover from? Would you put in any moments when your heart was broken? Would you include moments when your will and your resolve were not strong enough to change the outcome of something. In all of those scenarios, we learn things. In all of those scenarios, we grow and mature. In all of those scenarios, our capacity of trust in God deepens. The truth is, left to our own devices, we would arrange a life that doesn't need God. So the question is, is that real life? No questions, no doubts, no fears, no loss, no challenges, no complications, no problems, no inconveniences. Is that real life? Because I have already listened to lots of people who say something like this. They're not living in the real world. Just ask them what they mean by that. And they'll tell you, and it's absent, a lot of this absence of responsibility, absence of difficulty, absence of, of financial challenges. Like they're, they're just not living in the real world. Well, Jesus came into the real world. Sometimes problems and challenges aren't what wound us. They reveal the wound in us. Sometimes we feel pain and that, oh, that person hurt me. Maybe they didn't. I'm not saying the pain isn't real. Maybe what they did is they revealed the pain that was already there. So let me ask you, is real life just creating an insulated life that no one touches you so you experience no pain? Or is real life not only being aware that that pain exists, but seeking a healer who can heal and restore? That's where God does some of his real work in our real life. And then fourthly, uh, real life partners with God to do something through us. Real life partners with God to do something through us. It, it's astonishing how often we assume that our efforts, our gifts, our abilities, our talents, our presence, it will make no difference in someone else's life. It's a built-in assumption for so many of us. I know there are some people who walk around and, and they believe that everything they do makes a difference. And we all kind of wonder what it must be like to be them. But for most of us, we assume, yeah, I, well, I could say something. I just, I don't know that it would make any difference. The result is, is that we have thoughts, but we dismiss them. We have ideas, but we snuff them out. We have invitations, but we don't respond to them or we decline. We have opportunities, but we let them pass. What happens is we wind up being stuck, frozen by our insecurities, frozen by our, our inabilities. And now we start defining spiritual life that looks a lot like a mannequin in a store that's posing. That's not real life. Mannequins look good, and they're positioned to sell product. But they're not real people. Real people need an actual shoulder to cry on. Real people need a real ear to listen to them. Real people need real prayers to be prayed. Real people need real truth to be spoken. Real people need real wounds to be healed. And that's why 
the real God came in the real flesh and entered the real world to make a real difference. Yeah, I think that's good news. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. Um, Jesus didn't come to pose. Actually toyed with the idea. I looked it up. What are modeling poses for men? And I was going to strike a couple of them just to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's in your coffee cup, but you didn't get that here, I can tell you that. Or bodybuilders. Yeah, you've seen them pose, right? Yeah, they wear as little as possible to show as much as possible, which is the exact opposite of what most of us do. Wear as much as possible to expose as little as possible. Um, one of the things I really don't like is when we freeze Jesus into a moment of time and the picture is always something that portrays him as the aloof balloon, distant enough to not be touched, important enough to not be ignored. Every once in a while you'll come across a, a picture of Jesus where it doesn't look like a pose. I've seen a picture of Jesus where he's sitting and children are surrounding him and he's laughing. There's the human Jesus. Or standing and looking out over a city. There's no prophetic pose. There's just tears running down his face because, why? Because they're not showing up to his meetings? No. He says they're like sheep who are lost and they're being harassed and they don't have a shepherd, and life is harder for them right now than it needs to be. I love that, Jesus. Real life isn't wrapped in the prettiest and neatest wrappings. Just like real life when it enters this world isn't wrapped in the prettiest and neatest wrappings. I was in the room for the birth of both of our children, and, and they did not come into this world with cute outfits. Those came later. Covered in amniotic fluid attached to an umbilical cord. They entered this world. And while everyone in the room acted the professional, everyone does the exact same thing. It doesn't matter how much education you have or do not have. You wait for two things, movement and sound. And when those legs start kicking and that voice is lifted up, which I think is one of the most important things in the world, I love it that the first thing God does to prove we're alive is he wants our voice to be heard in the world. <laughs> That's an important thing. So many people telling us to be quiet. And God is saying, your voice is needed. Why? Because it's a real voice from a real person in a real world. That's why. That is what makes the difference. Real life. So, I know, they come into the world often with pointy heads and wrinkled skin and completely naked and, and it's life. It's life. If you can see through the eyes of Jesus, even when you see broken people, you see life. I think our world could use a little bit more of that. Sure, we have to pose a little less. Maybe we have to be willing to be a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more honest. All the people who came to Jesus in the New Testament who tried to impress him went away with a sad story. All the people who came honestly and vulnerably went away with the most amazing story. Virtual life, you can capture that in a photo and post it. And there's a lot of people who think that's what other people's lives actually are. It's not. Real life looks like real life. My last point, the grace of Jesus and the power of Jesus work best in the real world, 
for real people who have real issues. That's why we're not here for a performance. Our church doesn't do performances. We offer services. That's the difference. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, if we could design our life, we would make it easier, the burdens more bearable, the situations prettier, more photo ready. Pain would be non-existent. Complications would be easily resolved. Relational tensions, well, they wouldn't exist at all. But we find ourselves in a world that feels sometimes all too real to us. The pain, even the medication, can't completely make go away. The relational tensions, it seems like every word, a syllable, a look, a tone, just only makes it worse. And we are flustered and flummoxed and frustrated by those things. We want and hope what's best for others, and then we watch them take steps in ways that seem to reduce the capacity of the best happening or maybe eliminating it altogether. And we get tired, tired with what we hear, tired with what we see, tired with all the responsibilities that we carry. You were tired too. That was part of real life. And your real life has changed our world. It's changing us right now. We want to live your real life in our real world so that you get the credit, the glory, the honor. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's all stand together.